Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a pleasure for me to be here with you at Campion College. I'm assuming your patron is St. Edmund Campion. That's probably the only famous Campion there is. Um, he, of course, celebrated the traditional Latin Mass, which is very much um, at the heart of my own work, the explanation and defense of that Mass. Um, he didn't die just for the faith in a generic sense. You could say with, with truth that he died for that Mass, um, the Mass that the Jesuits came uh, to England with under Queen Elizabeth and the mass that was considered a form of idolatry. All right, so this evening I'm going to speak uh, about the difference between survival and flourishing. Why Catholics must take seriously culture and fine art. Every year, governments fund artists, whether they deserve it or not, to the tune of millions of dollars. Every year, millions of tourists crisscross the globe to visit museums like the Prado or the Louvre, the Met or the National Gallery, to visit sites of French Gothic, Italian Renaissance or German Baroque architecture, and to attend concerts and operas of music written by the great composers. Far from living in a world without art, modern people are continually inundated with visual images and sounds to the point of oversaturation and overstimulation. Yet, one might make a compelling case that never has a period of history been as out of touch with the religious and metaphysical wellsprings of fine art as we are, or less in tune with the motivations that prompt the kind of great art we admire and reproduce on t-shirts, posters, coffee mugs, and other such paraphernalia. What is the big deal with the fine arts? Why are they so important in human life and for Christians in the worship of God? Can we recover the right attitude and understanding of art within the Catholic Church? More broadly, we ought to ask ourselves, what accounts for the enormous difference that culture makes in human life, such that a good culture will have an elevating effect, maybe even disposing a person to God's grace, while a bad culture, on the contrary, will have a dehumanizing effect? If this is true, surely Catholics above all must take these matters seriously and see that they hold the key to the difference between merely surviving and actually flourishing. I want to start with a German theologian whom I'm sure many of you have heard of, Romano Guardini. In his 1956 book, The End of the Modern World, Romano Guardini claimed that modern man is so cut off from nature and culture that he will eventually reach an existential nakedness in which he will be compelled to stand empty-handed before God with no supports anymore in the world he inhabits. And in this moment, Guardini thinks, he will be able to achieve a superior enlightenment, a purer faith, a deeper holiness. Learning, culture, signs, and symbols will fall away, yielding to a free and rational mysticism that goes past the trappings we used to rely upon. There is something about this picture of man isolated in the midst of a barren modernity that should strike us as inhuman, unchristian, even uncatholic, anti-Catholic. It also happens to be anti-Guardinian, in the sense that Guardini himself argued for a different and saner view in other books. In his classic of 1935, The Spirit of the Liturgy, which was so um, in influential on Cardinal Ratzinger, Guardini addresses the question at some length. And in this passage I'm about to quote, whenever Guardini says spiritual life, I think it would be entirely fair to say in addition intellectual life and political life, because these all operate on analogous principles. So here's what he says, quote, Individuals on short waves of enthusiasm can, to a wide degree, dispense with learning and culture. This is proved by the beginnings of the desert orders in Egypt and of the mendicant friars and by holy people in all ages. But, generally speaking, a fairly high degree of genuine learning and culture is necessary in the long run in order to keep spiritual life healthy. And as I said, I would also say intellectual life and political life. By means of these two things, spiritual life retains its energy, clearness, and Catholicity. Culture preserves spiritual life from the unhealthy, eccentric, and one-sided elements with which it tends to get involved only too easily. Culture enables religion to express itself and helps it to distinguish what is essential from what is non-essential. 
The church has always condemned every attempt at attacking science, art, property, and so on. The same church which so resolutely stresses the one thing necessary, and which upholds with the greatest impressiveness the teaching of the evangelical councils, that we must be ready to sacrifice everything for the sake of eternal salvation, nevertheless desires as a rule that spiritual life should be impregnated with the wholesome salt of genuine and lofty culture. Unquote. To reinforce the point, Guardini responds to an objection that as long as God is at work in the soul, we don't need anything else. Quote, Certainly the grace of God is self-sufficient. Neither nature nor the work of man is necessary in order that a soul may be sanctified. God can awaken of these stones children to Abraham. But as a rule, he wishes that everything which belongs to man in the way of good, lofty, natural, and cultural possessions shall be placed at the disposal of religion and so serve the kingdom of God. He has interconnected the natural and the supernatural order and has given natural things a place in the scheme of his supernatural designs." Unquote. One of the most important of these natural things that God makes use of is what we call culture. Now, culture is difficult to define, but let me just give at least a, a, a nominal definition of it. Culture may be defined as the shared ways in which a society or people is accustomed to expressing, celebrating, and inculcating its vision of reality. On this definition, a Catholic culture is just what a society inspired by the faith will produce and cherish, an environment that turns the mind to God gently and frequently, making full use of the high beauties of fine art and the rugged genius of folk art, the impressive pageantry of ceremonial and the stabilizing force of rituals. Such a culture shapes the space and structures the time in which we live, work, rest, play, fast, and feast. It points us to common goals and ultimate goals, to personal aims and collective aims. We can say without exaggeration that we owe a good part of our identity to a certain collective memory, the continually renewed remembrance of who and what we are, and all the cultural forms that embody this remembrance. This identity is not primarily conceptual or intellectual, it's not a list of propositions we adhere to, but dwells in concrete, visible, audible, tangible expressions that serve as prompts for self-knowledge, incentives for action, and supports in turning or returning to God. So let me give examples of what I mean. When you see a church building that looks like a church building, or when you see a roadside shrine, which you can find all throughout Europe, when you see a crucifix on a wall, when you feel the feel of holy water as you enter the church, when you hear bells ringing from the, from the church towers, when you hear the sound of chant, all of these things are concrete expressions of Catholic identity, and they prompt our self-knowledge they move us to action, and they support us in turning to God. Man is a rational, linguistic, artistic being. Each man is born into a family and a people with a history of which he is a part and a native language. For these reasons, man is necessarily a cultural animal. To the extent that he is deprived of a rich cultural inheritance or inherits it only piecemeal, he suffers a certain dehumanization a denaturing that leaves him feeling incomplete, fragmented, disoriented, unmoored. To a greater or lesser extent, depending on his sensitivity and awareness, he cannot help seeing the inability to draw freely upon a heritage wider and deeper than himself as a lack, a wound, a handicap, much as an orphan feels bereft of his parents. In like manner and for much the same reasons, man is a liturgical animal. The liturgy, after all, is the highest rational, linguistic, artistic activity vouchsafed to us in this life, and also the one most truly social or corporate, since it is the activity par excellence of the church as the family and people of God. It is the most sublime expression at once of the interiority of man and of his sociability rooted in a common history. Since the liturgy is not something we make up as we go along, or it, it shouldn't be that, we are, we are meant, it's something we're meant to receive as our most valuable possession. It follows that not to receive a rich inheritance of the sacred liturgy from our forefathers is equally contrary to our social nature and our supernatural dignity. 
Thus, in accordance with the Guardini of 1935 and contrary to the Guardini of 1956, a Catholic who does not have this double inheritance of culture and liturgy is living a suboptimal life, suffering from the spiritual distress of orphanhood and the malady of amnesia. It is not the life that the Word made flesh intended for his disciples. To go further, a minority cannot long survive in a hostile environment without external identifiable signs in which its allegiance to truth is unambiguously manifested. Such a minority will simply be assimilated to the enemy's signs. And that's, of course, the condition of Catholics in the modern world. We are a minority in a hostile environment, so we need signs and symbols more than ever, more than we would even on natural grounds. All people have sacraments or signs of what is sacred to them, venerated as guarantors of righteousness. The difference is between those who have true sacraments and those who have false ones. Something similar is true of the fine arts. We must have architecture, sculpture, furnishings, vestments, and especially music that is distinctively and recognizably Catholic if we are ever to maintain a lively awareness of who and what we are as sons of God, not children of this world. As rational and political animals, we are unavoidably steeped in signs by which we signify to others and to ourselves who and what we are, whence we have come, whither we are going. A passage from the poet David Jones makes this point strikingly. Quote, No wonder then that theology regards the body as a unique good. Without body, without sacrament. Angels only, no sacrament. Beasts only, no sacrament. Man, sacrament at every turn and all levels of the profane and the sacred, in the trivial and in the profound, no escape from sacrament." Unquote. The Christian faith, to the extent it is believed and lived, will necessarily create a Christian culture and a Christian society. It will demand them as its native environment and fairest flowering. As Pope John Paul II famously said, quote, the synthesis between culture and faith is not just a demand of culture, but also a demand of faith. A faith which does not become culture is a faith which has not been fully received, not thoroughly thought through, not faithfully lived out, unquote. On a different occasion, John Paul II brought up St. Benedict as an example, quote, Faith in Christ who became incarnate in history not only transforms individuals inwardly, but also regenerates peoples and their cultures. Only a faith that is the source of radical spiritual decisions can have an effect on an era's culture. Thus, the attitude of St. Benedict, the Roman patrician who left an aging society and withdrew in solitude, asceticism, and prayer, was decisive for the growth of Christian civilization. For the gospel brings culture to its perfection, and authentic culture is open to the gospel." Unquote. One might go so far as to say that the ancient church was bound to produce a Saint Benedict of Nursia, just because they were consistently living their faith. Alistair MacIntyre was by no means incorrect then to say in his book After Virtue that we too are waiting for our own Benedict. But I'm not so sure he was right that this Benedict, the modern Benedict, has to be doubtless very different, as McIntyre says. It is our modern pride that makes us think the modern Benedict must not look and think and act like the patriarch of Western monasticism and the co-patron of Europe. Perhaps the greatest surprise coming to the post-post-modern world will be a re-establishment of Christendom along classical lines, with kings seated on their thrones and monks chanting the divine office across the land, scholastics debating points of the divine law, and guilds turning out noble artifacts of every kind. Stranger things have happened in history. Nowadays, when traditional beliefs and practices are making an unexpected comeback in Catholicism, one sees skeptics shaking their heads and talking about how the tradition of the past is dead and buried, or beautiful but inaccessible, or how one risks weirdness in attempting to reconnect with something that is no longer sponta spontaneously seen and felt to be ours. To me, however, such skepticism makes little sense, because my experience in life has been that tradition is alive and well. 
but one has to give oneself to it. It is alive and well in those in whom it lives and flourishes. So let me try to explain what I mean by this. I'm a singer and composer of sacred music. I've written about 150 musical works, mostly choral music for the church. Sacred music has always been a realm of great conservatism in which each generation, while adding to the common store, continues to preserve and sing the inherited music. For example, when Renaissance polyphony was born, Gregorian chant did not vanish. It continued to be used alongside the new style. When the Baroque supplanted the Renaissance, secular music changed considerably, but in the liturgy of the church, one could still frequently hear the strains of Palestrina, Lassus, or Victoria. When Mozart and Haydn were writing their orchestral masses, the propers of the mass were still being chanted in the same age-old plain song. To this very day, wherever the liturgy is being celebrated as it ought to be, we will still hear those ancient chants, perhaps complemented by motets or masses drawn from any of the creative periods through which the faith has passed. To be a performer and composer of sacred music is to experience the perennial freshness and presentness of this entire heritage. It does not come across as stiffly old-fashioned, as if one were trying to revive an earlier style of clothing, like whalebone corsets. It comes across as ancient, sacred, appropriate, custom-made for its purpose. Now, when I write my own music, I follow my predecessors whether I consciously intend to do so or not. My homophony and polyphony will have chant-like melodies and established cadences. But the result never sounds like an attempt at an historically authentic reconstruction of a past composer, as if I'm pretending to be Palestrina, quite apart from the fact that I do not have the talent to pull off a perfectly convincing imitation of Palestrina, it is experientially evident that music by modern composers, however conservative they may be, still sounds like new music by moderns, yet rooted in the tradition to which they are happy to belong, and therefore in harmony with all that has come before. In other words, I have an experience of being myself, of producing my own work, while at the same time being in continuity with the Catholic tradition. There is no antagonism in this relationship. The past is not merely the past, since it lives on in my mind and heart as a present reality that I bring into the future. Palestrina is dead, but Palestrina's music, when, whenever it is performed, is as alive as it was when it first sounded in the churches of Rome. Committed to paper, the music acquires an ideal existence, and when performed, it achieves real existence again, in the present moment, and comes into the ears of people today as beautifully ordered sound. I've had a similar experience watching my children plunge themselves into the repertoires of their respective instruments, which happened to be piano, organ, harp, and lute. No matter what period of time the piece of music was from, or is from, they go at it as if it were hot off the press, written yesterday or this morning, and they make it come alive again, giving pleasure to the listeners. I see this reality of music as existing in the present moment, regardless of when it was written, as a kind of parable that, or paradigm, uh, a way of thinking about culture and fine art uh, and liturgy as well. These things exist in the present moment, no matter how old their origins are. For me, the most fundamental and life-changing experience in this regard has been discovering and apprenticing myself to the traditional liturgy of the Roman Catholic Church, becoming a pupil to its rich prayers and beautiful music, its pregnant gestures and magnificent symbols. It has taken me decades to reach a point where I am at one with this liturgy, where it speaks to me intimately, past all need for analysis. And so far from having lost its fascination through familiarity, it strikes me now as something I could not live without. I could not be without. This tradition, which for some outsiders is a cobweb-covered museum piece, is vibrantly alive in my soul and in the souls of many people I know. It has become for us not an object we gaze upon, like, like a chalice in a glass case in a museum, but a medium through which we live and look and love. The crucial factor in all that I have recounted is this. 
One has to immerse oneself in the tradition. It cannot be the dipping of a toe in the stream. It cannot be a cool academic consideration from afar, peering through multiple veils of commentary and scholarly apparatus. It has to be a full immersion experience, just like learning a language, if you really want to learn a language. One has to let go of oneself, forget oneself, abandon oneself to the reality at hand, and let it shape one's seeing and hearing, even one's expectations of what there is to be seen and heard. It is precisely at this point that modern self-consciousness, which is another way of saying the temptation of autonomy, objects. You'd better be careful about letting yourself go. You might end up a different person. You might get swallowed up and become a fanatic. It is better to keep control of yourself and keep a distance to maintain the objectivity of a neutral observer. And this is very much the sort of Cartesian attitude. It is the serpent whispering, don't be a fool. Those who immerse themselves in the river may drown. This objection, which all of us have faced in one form or another, shows that there is a certain choice involved in the failure to connect with tradition, at least for those who are fortunate enough to brush up against it. One is afraid to open oneself to the transcendent mystery it symbolizes and communicates. In his inaugural homily on April 24th, 2005, Pope Benedict XVI spoke of this dramatic alternative between fear and surrender. As we listen to his words, let us think not merely of Christ or Christianity in a generic sense, but of the riches of the Catholic faith in its concrete historic tradition. Quote, Are we not perhaps all afraid in some way? If we let Christ enter fully into our lives, if we open ourselves totally to him, are we not afraid that he might take something away from us? No. Only in this friendship are the doors of life opened wide. Only in this friendship is the great potential of human existence truly revealed. Only in this friendship do we experience beauty and liberation. Do not be afraid of Christ. He takes nothing away and he gives you everything. When we give ourselves to him, we receive a hundredfold in return. Yes, open, open wide the doors to Christ and you will find true life. Unquote. The philosopher Charles Taylor asserts that modern man is a buffered self. This is the term he coined in his book, A Secular Age. <laughs> modern man is a buffered self, buffered in the sense that he is impervious to the supernatural, on guard against the divine, no longer vibrating sympathetically with the harmonies of a God-revealing world. But there is a subtle illusion in this language. One is not born a buffered self, or fated to be one. One wants to be a buffered self out of fear of what God may be asking one to be or to become. At the end of the day, might not this buffered self be simply an apt psychological description of man's fallen condition, out of which he is meant to be drawn by the daily practice of religion and the persistent operation of God's grace? The whole force of Catholic spirituality is aimed at breaking down this opposition between the ego and God an opposition into which we are born because of original sin and against which we need to fight. <clears throat> Baptism, then, might be called the ontological unbuffering of the self, and the day-in, day-out life of prayer, asceticism, and charity towards one's neighbor is the slow and steady path by which we unbuffer the self in action, in habit, and in hope of eternal life. Now, just to bring this back round to my main theme, in my view, beauty, whether natural or supernatural, whether spontaneous or brought to us by the labor of fine art, helps break down this opposition between the ego and God. Beauty is the Lord's knock at the door of our hearts, asking for admittance. Beauty collapses, or at least throws a bridge over, the distance between mine and yours, outer and inner, past and present, material and spiritual, temporal and eternal, Beauty is not merely one of many useful means for tearing open man's perilous autonomy. It is the sharpest sword for the job. More specifically, I believe that the Western Christian tradition gives us uniquely profound and ample access to the mystery of beauty, and that the price of admission, 
is that we allow this mystery to act upon us as a living reality with which we are tangled up. For this to be possible, the tradition itself has to be able to speak to us. And we, for our part, have to be not hearers only, but doers of the word. Not archaeologists, but builders. Not observers, but lovers. Involved, rather than detached. We are all aware that artists and thinkers who value the cultural and spiritual traditions of the past are often accused by their critics of nurturing sentimentality, of suffering from an inferiority complex, of being lacking in originality, of being haunted by an insecurity that drives them to seek easier ready-made answers. Modern art critics, and perhaps modern people in general, believe that we are imprisoned within the present moment, as if there is an invisible but uncrossable wall of glass between us and the past. We can peer through it longingly, but we cannot go there. We cannot find ourselves in that world or find that world among us. No matter how much our desires and aspirations may seem to harmonize with those of the great tradition that precedes us, the critics repeat unceasingly the mantra, we cannot go back. It is as if the uncrossable abyss between Lazarus in Abraham's bosom and the suffering rich man were transferred into the domain of history and culture. I maintain that this mentality is a form of discouragement. And as St. Therese of this you said, discouragement is a form of pride. To say we cannot connect with our past and carry its meaning into the present is the language of those who are proud, not of those who are humble, childlike, hopeful, and eager. Indeed, it is based on a completely flawed way of thinking about directionality, velocity, and time, all of which are, for spiritual beings, much more complicated and paradoxical than they are for the simple projectiles studied by physics. That is, what it means to go forward or to go back, those, those metaphors quickly confuse people because they start taking them literally. <clears throat> In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis makes the following observation. Quote, We all want progress, but progress means getting nearer to the place you want to be. And if you have taken a wrong turning, then to go forward does not get you any nearer. If you are on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. And in that case, the man who turns back soonest is the most progressive man. We have all seen this when doing arithmetic. When I have started a sum the wrong way, the sooner I admit this and go back and start over again, the faster I shall get on. There is nothing progressive about being pig-headed and refusing to admit a mistake. And I think if you look at the present state of the world, it is pretty plain that humanity has been making some big mistakes. We are on the wrong road. And if that is so, we must go back. Going back is the quickest way on. Unquote. The philosopher Dennis McInerney expresses the same thought more compactly. Quote, there are times in life when the only responsible and rational way we can go forward is by going back returning to the point where we became disoriented and started going in the wrong direction." Unquote. Obviously, one cannot go back in the sense of reliving or recreating the past as past, but one can and must always be reaching into the past for inspiration, for tried and true models, for a trustworthy way of life. One looks to the past in order to bring something of its fire and spirit into the present moment and into every future generation. As I suggested earlier, what we call past is present in the heart and mind of the one in whom it lives, even as what is present is unreal for those who are unaware of it or incapable of sharing it. Even, even the idea of the present is paradoxical. To think then that we are uniquely stranded in our age, cut off from the beneficent and fertilizing influence of tradition, is a peculiarly modern form of pride even perhaps a subtle form of vanity. We want to view ourselves as different from every former age and therefore as freed from our obligations to our predecessors, the fundamental obligation of grateful receptivity that every generation owes to its ancestors and to the works they have left for us to admire, to emulate, and to surpass if we can. To think that we must forge ahead on a new path that is not in continuity with the past is a pernicious error, actually a denial of our creaturely dependence on all the causes that made us what we are and continue to make us what we are. 
A certain vision of modernity, one namely that emphasizes how different we are from our predecessors and how good it is that we be as different as possible, becomes in reality a kind of excuse for giving up on the arduous labor of acquiring the knowledge and craftsmanship that enable artists to produce their very best work. No doubt we are facing new challenges, new levels and degrees of rupture with our cultural and religious past. No doubt there are new human elements in the grand mixture of our times that require attentive judgment and a ready adaptability. Nevertheless, the basic ingredients of the Christian life are still those furnished by our common human nature, the apostolic deposit of faith, age-old theological discourse, ecclesiastical monuments, the capacity of reason in man to resonate with the truth wherever it is found, and most of all, the yearning of the heart to belong to a family that has its own proud history and knows it well. Some of these ingredients can be held in contempt by some people for some time, but together they continue to exert their force which is inherent in them and always susceptible to reawakening as embers can be blown again into flame. It is the role of poets, painters and musicians, sculptors and architects, philosophers and priests to stir up this inherent force of tradition, to keep it brightly awake so that we can live truly human lives capable of being raised up to the divine and the eternal. Without a lively and ardent connection to the givens of our historical and metaphysical journey, individuals will be lost, wandering, perishing, seeking a watered garden where there is only a wasteland. It is not without significance that throughout the history of the church, reform movements always look back. They look to the apostolic age as when religious orders of every century model their way of life after the blueprint given in the Acts of the Apostles. They look back to the origins of monasticism in the Egyptian desert. They look back to the spirit and rule of their founders. They appeal to the church fathers, the councils, the annals of the saints. It is part of the very essence of Christianity to be looking both backwards and forwards. Indeed, strangely enough, to look to the future only through the past. The most important thing we do as Christians, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, obeys a command given 2,000 years ago, do this in memory of me. This ever-renewed memory brings the Lord into our very midst, uniting our time with his eternity, fusing past, present, and future into a single narrative. The binding force of tradition liberates those it binds from the tyrannical fads and fashions of their own particular age with its copious blind spots and prejudices. Does this earnestly past-oriented position consign us to the doom of inferiority? Does it confine our movements to preset dances like the minuet or the waltz? Does it whisper that we should resign ourselves to be custodians of a glory that has long since departed the temple? Of course not. But what it does say is that we shall never become anything worthwhile without apprenticing ourselves to the power and subtlety of our tradition, striving to make it our own language that we will never augment the treasury with our own offerings unless we have first accepted the offerings of our forebears with a wonder-filled wonder appreciation, that we will never actualize our potential unless we enter into our work with a spirit of intelligent imitation and playful rivalry, with the humility to be part of a greater whole, a member of a guild that stretches across centuries. When we refuse to consider ourselves superior to tradition, and when we refuse the temptation to consider it impossibly distant and irrecoverable, we can then leverage it for our good and the good of our students, our clients, our audiences. We can, as it were, tap into its current of associations and its immediate impact. In this way, and only in this way, will new things emerge out of old things in a manner that is gentle and organic, not violent or mechanistic or self-punishing or ironic. I would dare to say that only in this way will anything truly new emerge at all, as opposed to failed experiments in novelty that aren't even worth a glance or a listen. The Benedictine monks of Norcia provide a marvelous example of what I am talking about, the peaceful and fruitful continuity with past tradition. To begin with, the monks themselves are the most brilliant example of giving an old idea new juice or new beer, perhaps. As Rod Dreher narrates, 
Rod Dreher narrates in his book, The Benedict Option. Quote, Father Martin flashed a broad grin from beneath his black beard and said that all Christians can have this life of joy based on ancient tradition if they are willing to do what it takes to mount the recovery, to pick up what we have lost and to make it real again. There's something here that's very ancient, but it's also new, Father Martin said. People say, oh, you're just trying to turn back the clock. That makes no sense. If you're doing something right now, it means you're doing it right now. It's new and it's alive, and that's a very powerful thing." Unquote. But more to the point, some years ago, the monks hired an Italian painter of icons. This painter lived with the monks for a long time and painted frescoes on the walls and ceilings of the monastic refectory for the benefit of the monks and their table guests. His work is exquisite, as if the gap of centuries between us and the age of Giotto or Fra Angelico had dropped away by a miracle. Yet the iconography in his work, the special combination of Old Testament, New Testament, and Benedictine narratives requested by the monks, exists nowhere else in the world. And the way the artist has rendered clothing and natural objects is his own variation, like the dialect of a common language. The old, the new, the traditional, and the unique come together harmoniously as they are intended to do. The result is a vibrant new existence of tradition in our very midst, as our own and yet not merely our own. To problematize tradition, to imagine that our relationship with it has to be complicated, torturous, self-doubting, anxious, and agonized, as if we have to make apologies or find excuses or plausible reasons to love it, is one of the gravest symptoms of modern man's disease. He problematizes tradition to the extent that he wants it to be a problem because he thinks this will somehow free him to live a more authentic life of his own. It is, in other words, a thirst for autonomy, for being free of precisely those bonds that perfect us as social and spiritual beings. Modern Western man often lives according to the opinion and feeling that it's all up to us. But one of the many virtues of tradition is that fundamentally it, whatever it is referring to, is not up to us. We are in the position of receivers. We can give only in as much as we first and always receive. What hast thou that thou hast not received? asks St. Paul. And if thou hast received, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? That's 1 Corinthians 4 7. Our highest dignity consists not in the mere possession of freedom of choice, indifferent to that, this or that object, but in the free exercise, not forced by another, of humility and gratitude, in choosing again and again to make a good use of the good things God has given us, to embrace the treasures handed down to us in culture and to make them fruitful within us and around us. Our dignity also consists at times in freely saying no, to that which is unworthy of rational and social beings, or unworthy of God to whom it is to be offered, freely repudiating inferior goods and looking for that which is more worthy. As educator Michael Platt says, quote, revolutions in manners and morals often start with just one or two or a few persons saying no to something. Human things are often like an army in flight that will never turn until one soldier stands and fights. It is sometimes, it is sometimes said, you can't bring back the past, but you can. And strong ages such as the Renaissance and the Reformation do precisely that, revive and renew something lost, forgotten, and good." Unquote. It is, if I could use the expression, the spiritual aristocracy of traditionalists, those who can draw water from a deep reservoir, who will find the right way forward not the technocracy of the latest experts with their shallow solutions. This, I might add, is no less true of the Catholic Church, her sacred arts, and her sacred liturgy. Our current ecclesiastical crisis is characterized by the replacement of dense religious practice with lightweight humanistic posturing, ascetical mystical aspirations with this-worldly agendas, high ideals with bureaucratic slogans, refined artistic taste with the vulgarities of pop culture. In short, we are sorely in need of a spiritual aristocracy of clergy, religious, and laity who are animated by a desire for the best, which of course is what aristocracy means, the rule of the best. 
which translates into sanctity for the soul, honor for the heart, wisdom for the mind, discipline for the body. This is the program of traditional Catholicism. I hardly need to point out that it is not currently the dominant program, or shall we say, paradigm. Our human potential for the beautiful is immense. In the realm of music alone, consider the stunning masterpieces left to us by the likes of Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina, Thomas Louise de Victoria, Johann Sebastian Bach, Georg Friedrich Handel, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Ludwig van Beethoven, and to race ahead to our own day, Heinrich Goretzky, John Tavener, and Arvo Part. Apart from rare circles, this human potential is nowadays dreadfully underestimated and underdeveloped. Young people today are not even aware of the artistic potential of their souls, either as makers or as recipients of the gift of fine art. We should be helping them in every way we can, including training Catholic students to give the best of their artistic talent to the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and at very least, educating them to appreciate how the Mass has received throughout history and still deserves the very best in all of the arts. In conclusion, allow me to recapitulate. Among Catholics today, one can still encounter the strange phenomenon of a sort of tormented or self-doubting relationship with tradition, as if they admire it and feel a longing to recover it, while at the same time fearing it is impossible to have it anymore. They will tell you at one moment how beautiful and how fraught with meaning are certain customs, prayers, or liturgies, and, and in the next moment will shake their heads about those misguided people who want to bring all this back when the church is doing something different now. So in spite of the healthy wound of beauty and the sting of nostalgia that on behalf of God beckons us into the wide open spaces of Christian tradition, we, in, we end up feeling trapped in the shell of late modern garbage. We try to console ourselves with the cold comfort of knowing that even if what we have is second or third rate, at least it's our own. Somehow this is supposed to be reassuring. And somehow it is supposed to guard against the temptations of escapism or elitism. This attitude is a manifestation of discouragement, which I repeat is a form of pride. While it may look like humility to say we are stuck with second or third best and should not aspire to greatness, that attitude sharply contrasts with the true humility of the artisan who says, this old chair is lovely. I will copy it as well as I can. Is there a rule written down somewhere that artists must not copy the work of their predecessors? On the contrary, as the history of the fine arts teaches us, all great artists without exception have begun as apprentices, learning, absorbing, imitating, drinking deeply from the fountain of the past. The craftsmen of the Middle Ages, responsible for a vast body of exquisite art and glorious architecture, routinely copied all that they liked and improved on it or varied it according to their own abilities or their patrons' desires. What is true of art is true of life. There is no rule that says we cannot believe, say, and do what our forefathers believed, said, and did. I love this verse from the book of Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus. 635. Stand in the multitude of ancients that are wise, and join thyself from thy heart to their wisdom, that thou mayest hear every discourse of God, and the sayings of praise may not escape thee. In fact, we would be fools to act otherwise. Our Catholicism would be somewhat like the sun described by Heraclitus, which dies each day so that a new one can be born the next morning. In reality, there is either continuity with our tradition, which guarantees abundant fruit, or there is rupture and severance from it, which brings exponentially compounding problems. So much that has taken place in the past half century has diluted, distorted, divided, or otherwise needlessly complicated Catholicism by pretending it must change, catch up, try on new garb, shut out the past, and say goodbye to dogmatic certainties. The neo-Catholic perspective abandons us to groping confusion, within which our faith can offer us only mantras of kindness, mutual aid, and generic religiosity. As the prophet Isaiah says, we have groped for the wall, and like the blind, we have groped as if we had no eyes. We have stumbled at noonday as in darkness. We are in dark places as dead men. Isaiah 59, 10. 
Such sins against truth and tradition yield the wages of death. Death to liturgy and prayer, death to priestly and religious vocations, death to missionary work, death to marriage and family, death to education, death to a culture of beauty. Life, the vitality of the church in her own nature, will come from our humble embrace of truth and tradition, or it will never come at all. Reflecting on all of this, I have to wonder where the phenomenon of proudly clinging to our modern mediocrity comes from. Why do otherwise intelligent people needlessly problematize the situation of the church and of the Catholic in the modern world, wringing their hands at supposedly insoluble problems, feeling tempted to rush along with fads and fashions, and resisting the still, small voice that calls them back to the potent treasury of the ages? Let us do what we can to break through and break down this enervating tendency to problematize what is obviously good, holy, noble, and sublime, to which instead we should dedicate ourselves, embracing it wholeheartedly. It is understandable that the devil would do all he can to thwart this conversion. For in each and every soul that undergoes it, tradition lives anew in our midst and brings new life to a world out of date. Thank you very much.